Hey folks, my name's Kevin and it's time for a little bit more knife nerdery and today we're going to be taking a relatively quick look at these three prototypes of upcoming knives from Grambo Knives. Um, this is going to be a relatively quick look uh, for a couple of different reasons. Um, partly I just haven't had them for all that long, partly this is a, uh, you know, these are prototypes and this is a pass around, though I, I did actually take this one apart and then immediately as soon as I did that realized that I probably wasn't supposed to do that, we'll get to that whole part later, um, but this one's really interesting, uh, in part because I honestly didn't even realize that I was getting these when I signed up for the pass around for this, but it's a whole other thing, in part because there's some, um, there's already some really good content on these. These have been passed around for over five months at this point, and so there's some really thorough videos from folks like Jared Neves or Stasa23 and other channels, so if you want to learn more about these knives, um, go go check out their channels for sure. They've got really great content. I'll link some of those down below. But I still wanted to make a video about this because these knives are doing some interesting things, especially this one that I knew I wanted to check out that I wanted to highlight because they're doing some stuff that's just kind of weird, kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk all about that. Um, backing up a little bit, Grambo Knives. There, It's a, a guy named Kane Grambo. He's a self-described spare time knife maker and designer. So he does do uh, custom knives in his own uh, shop down in Australia. But these three are production knives that he has done through Best Tech. These are pre-orders that have already ended, but if you go on his website, the pre-orders are all listed as more coming soon. So if you are interested in any of these, continue following him. It seems like there's going to be a second production round on both of these, uh, or I guess all three of these. And so, yeah, worth checking out for sure. Um, let's start off by talking about this one because this is the one that I was really trying to sign up for in the first place, the one that really caught my eye and the one that I, I knew I was getting. This is called the Russ, and man, wow, the, the thwack on that is just bonkers. It is such an authoritative thwack. Anyway, I think this is, I mean, okay, I think this is a pretty gorgeous design, except I personally don't love the blade shape. This is very much a Les George blade shape in my mind. It looks very much like the VECPs. And so to my eye, this is a Les George blade, which I know some people are super duper into, but you know, with jimping that I prefer, and then a really beautiful, aesthetically designed, um, just flowy, geometric, wonderful handle. I love this handle. The blade's not for me, but a lot of people love Les George's style. And um, so I think this blade shape will be up a lot of people's alley. It's just not for me. The one thing that makes it, I mean, everything about this looks like a Les George blade to me, but one thing that really, really makes it stand out is this prominent upward sweeping thumb ramp with jimping on it, followed by this hump back down that looks like like kind of an eyebrow with an eye underneath it. That's something that Bob Terzula, I think, pioneered, but Les George has done it a lot too. The big difference between this and a Les George blade is that Les George would have the kind of giant cavernous jimping that I absolutely loathe, and this jimping is much, much more my alley. This is the kind of stuff that's crisp and sharp, uh, but flat and doesn't hurt. It doesn't give you the, the crazy grip in gloves you would find with something like that. But I'm not going to spend too much time on this blade, except for to tell you the fact that this is a three and a half inch blade. And the reason is because all of the things about it are going to be changing. Like right now, this is uh, just over three and a half millimeters. It's 0.1385 inches, but supposedly they're bumping that up to 3.9 millimeters. I don't 100% understand why, other than the fact that they're changing this over to being a um, a hollow grind. And I, I sometimes OEMs say that if you're going to have a hollow grind, you need to have a thicker blade stock to begin with for them to have room to hollow it out. I guess that's probably what he ran into, or maybe he just likes thicker blades on, on hollow grind. I don't know. I don't really care hair because the blade portion of this knife, as nice as it is, and it seems like it would be a very good kind of harder use blade, it's nice and thick. The blade portion of this knife is not at all what I cared about when I wanted to check this out. Everything I cared about is what's going on back here, and this is where all the cool weird stuff is happening. So yeah, first of all, aesthetically, I adore this handle. I think it just has such really nice fluid lines that roll into each other in just the right spots. It's got enough uh, angularity and enough curvature. I think this is a 
gorgeous handle. It also feels so nice in my hands. This is a larger knife than I would normally go for, but this kind of relatively neutral but flowing handle fits so, so good. So if he ever did a version of this on a, I don't know, three and a quarter inch knife or something like that that didn't have this type of blade, um, I would probably be all over it because I, I love this handle just from aesthetics alone. But let's talk about some other fun stuff like um, here. Look at that. Look at that. That is weird. That's one of the very first things that caught my eye on this knife. This has a really odd, unique pivot and just kind of screw system in general. There's only these two screws on the knife and both of them are completely transparent. Now, the one in the back obviously could double as a lanyard hole as a result, and I think that's a clever way of doing it. And since I don't care about a lanyard hole, hiding the lanyard hole into something that just kind of ties into the rest of the knife in an interesting way, this means that I would have this knife and not care at all that there's a lanyard hole on it, because to me, it doesn't feel like a lanyard hole. It feels like a weird, interesting knife system, uh, like screw system. I think it's really, really neat. On the pivot, we get things weirder, because like, the reason why I took this apart, we'll cut to that in a moment, but the reason why I took this apart, the big reason was because it was feeling gritty and I felt like I don't want to clean it, but I also really wanted to look inside because what the heck, there's got to be a hole going all the way through the pivot. So that means the pivot itself has to be kind of huge. And spoiler alert, it is huge. We'll take a look at that, like I said, when we get inside. On the back of these right now, they've got these slots. And that's something that's going away on the production version. And I think, I think it's a really, really good thing that goes away because as far as I can tell, these are just aesthetic. Like they line up perfectly straight or this one lines up with this angle back. And I do think it looks cool aesthetically, but they're just aesthetic. And um, because this is, a, a, I'm 99% sure, a completely captive pivot that cannot turn and this back part is not, is part of the, the captive pivot itself. It's these sides that come out to disassemble this. Um, and so having something that looks so much like a screw slot that doesn't actually turn is just begging for people to crank on this, have their, their flathead screwdriver pop out because they're putting so much torque because it can't actually go and just scrape up the knife. So I'm really glad that's going away. The other thing is that on this one, he's putting the, the, the Grambo name onto that pivot itself. And all of those changes I think are good things. But yeah, when we get inside, this is this is some weird, interesting, neat things. Uh, the other weird thing that he's doing that I honestly don't know why he's doing is there's this hole right here that as far as I can tell has to be for accessing the detent hole. Like that is the, that like that right there. I don't know how well you'll be able to see, but that is the detent hole and it perfectly lines up right there. It perfectly lines up with this. And I've never really seen anyone do that. I can't really think of a particularly great reason for that. The only thing I could think of is that, um, like it's not an exposed detent. It's like the tiniest bit exposed right there, but sometimes you can get gunk in the detent hole itself and you, you know, that would, you know, prevent the knife from the detent ball from fully engaging. And that could be a problem. I've, I've never really had that be a big thing. Uh, knives that don't have the detent hole fully exposed in some way. If the detent hole is fully exposed in the open position, especially then gunk can get in it when you're cutting. It can still happen in your knife, but I, my only guess is that this is meant so that you can take like a little toothpick in there and squirrel that around. Or maybe this is so that you can apply lube in there. But I, again, I don't really see that as a great benefit because if you want to put lube on the detent ball without impacting the, uh, the taking apart the knife, it's really easy. It's right there. It's really easy on a lot of knives, but this is a knife with a thick blade. So you have a large amount of access here and the detent ball is really far out, which I like to see. And so if you do want to put lube on the detent ball, yeah, you don't need this hole, but that's the only thing I can think of. Cause again, like you can follow, it's perfectly centered on the detent ball path and perfectly lines up with that hole. I don't know. Okay. Let's move further back because the other really cool thing and weird thing this is doing is this at a glance, this looks like a liner lock. If you look closer, this is kind of a frame lock, kind of a bolster lock, kind of a subframe lock. I don't even know. It's just a really neat way of going about this because like if you look at the way a bolster lock works, this is a bolster lock. The, uh, the same piece of titanium is all traveling all the way around. And instead of being a frame lock like this, they've cut away some portion of this and 
placed a overlay on top. And so what you get is the back half of the lock bar has been thinned out. We'll talk about the impact that has on lock bar pressure on these when we get there, but the short version is that it generally lightens the lock bar pressure. Over here, we're doing the same kind of thing, except the Oh, like overlay is an inlay and it's only over this portion and it fits so fluidly in that you you honestly just wouldn't know that it was even there. Like this screw looks like it's just a body screw that, that you frequently will find on frame lock knives. It's not until you really look at how the seam is lining up here that you, you realize that this is all one piece of titanium and this is an overlay on top. Again, I don't know. Is there a really good reason to do it this way as opposed to doing this as just like a standard liner lock or something? I, I don't know. Probably not. But is it as good as a standard liner lock in terms of keeping your fingers off the lock bar and all that other kind of fun? Absolutely. Like, it's just kind of neat. Um, on the production versions, apparently this diamondy pattern is going to be expanded slightly and other fun stuff, but I don't really care. It's just cool. Uh, if you look at the way that this is being done right here, we'll look at this a little bit more when we take it apart, but you can see that there is a steel lock bar insert right here. And that's partly because this uh, piece of titanium that's left over is still thick enough. It's thicker than you'll find on a lot of, of liner locks. And so they still have enough meat in order to, be able to put a steel lock bar in there. And there is like a whole like there's the screws that are holding it in. There's all like cut out in there. One other thing that I really do like is that they left this uh, unmilled part underneath. If they had left this diamond pattern, now this isn't all that rough. It's not going to catch you that hard. But as you're sliding this in and out of your pocket, it would add more traction that you wouldn't want. It would add more wear to the back of your pants. And so it's just really nice seeing that part there. Um, yeah, overall, I liked this clip a lot. Sometimes I don't like when clips come up with a point like that. And this clip is long enough that if I were to choke all the way back, then it's it's pushing me up here into this this pad on my hand. And I don't like that. But that I don't know why you would ever hold it back here. And so if I hold this in my natural grip, even in my slightly smaller than this knife is meant for kind of hands, this hits my, my hand just perfectly. And I don't notice this point at all. And I, yeah, I really like the way that this this uh, feels in hand. I I just, man, I just really like the look of this handle. It's got such unique details everywhere. And once you take away these slots, I think it's just going to look even a little bit more clean. Now, I do think maybe they could have potentially moved this, this screw inside, but I think what that would re mean is that they'd have, I don't think they could do it in, uh, I don't think this is thick enough that they could, they could just have it screw partially through. I think it would have to stick out the other side and then they'd, like if this was a true custom knife, I think that the person could potentially do that and then polish off the end of the screw, but you're never going to have a company like Bass Tech polish off the ends of screws. You'll find that on, on true custom knives, things like Herman and um, I don't even know, other, not very many people do that period. Um, overall, from functionality perspective, now this has a front flipper and kind of like, okay, I got it to work. I'm really glad that my first attempt uh, worked on camera because I have failed this plenty of times. It's it's barely in my mind usable as a front flipper. It's one of those like technically a front flipper as well type knives. And honestly, my preference would be to just not have that there. Like, I don't think this is a good enough front flipper that I think it's worth using as a front flipper. And so I would personally rather this just more cleanly end right there, um, and which would mean they'd have to move this stop pin just slightly further forward, which maybe they, I don't know, it looks like they have enough room to do that. But whatever, some people will probably have no difficulty with it. Oh man, I keep hitting into my hand. Part of this is just too big of a knife for me. And so I have a difficulty holding it without um, twisting it into my hand. And thus I keep on accidentally hitting my hand with that. But let's talk about the other deployment method. This is obviously a thumb stud knife. And the, the, the big problem here is the placement of those thumb studs are just too far in. If you look at what's going on here, this is right up against this. Now it's not so right up against it, but it's right up against it enough given the fact that there is no like chamfer in giving you access. So like if you look down this, there's almost no access to the top of this. And so you basically can't get your thumb in here in a way that allows you to flick outward. It, like you kind of can, but it's, it, it's, yeah, it's not working. So what you have to do instead is flick upward. The problem is with this swoop here, it guides your thumb this direction this direction, upwards, towards the pivot. And that's not a direction you can actually push. You can't push this direction. 
because you're pushing into the pivot. You have to push this direction, and it's not that you can't do it, it's just I find that this kind of thing leads my thumb into misunderstanding where I'm supposed to go. And so from an intuitive direction design kind of thing, I think this thing would just work a lot better if they pulled this, this thumb stud further out towards the edge or chamfered this down in a way that, that kind of guided your thumb in this direction. It kind of a little bit does that right here, but if you do flick straight up, it works perfectly fine. It, the, the big the big thing here is that this has a very, very firm detent. And this is coming from the fact that it's got fully deep lock bar engagement and enough lock bar pressure because of how thick this is left over. It's not a very strong lock bar, but it's a very springy lock bar. Like it takes, it's one of those things, it's, it's, it's not a, um, it's not super rigid, but it has a lot of force. There's two different ways that a lock bar can be putting a lot of force on it. It can either be like a very rigid lock bar that doesn't flex a whole lot, but it's in the right spot, or it can be a very flexible lock bar that, is, that has a lot of flow over. So this is the kind of thing when we take this apart, this springs up a good bit. It's got a lot of travel left in it. And so it's already being compressed a lot. So yeah, this has a very firm detent. And since the angle of axis is so kind of weird, when you finally do get it going, you're going straight up and you've got, man, it just, it flies out with this really wild pop. Partly what's really cool is that this pop sounds amazing because this whole part being cut away here creates this echo chamber right here. And I know this shouldn't be all that different from a liner lock, but the fact that this is a full tie liner lock effectively, and the fact that this is exposed and it's not like a sub, it's not like a, what do they call those these days? Inset liner locks where this is kind of ca captured off. You just have this really big pocket right here and it echoes, it really does. And it makes, it makes a heck of a sound. It is really, really cool. I find the reverse flick on this to be really hard, really like you can do it, there again, got lucky my first try, but I have I have failed this plenty of times because again you have to come at it from below, and it's just it's just not on my hands the most natural grip, and so I've found many times I slid off of this, and it kind of sucks to slide off it. But if you do manage to catch it from below, you can certainly get it. And so if I were like the pre-production is, I mean, sorry, the pre-order is already ended on this. These are coming and they're going to be delivered in, in something approximating this fashion. And so it's too late for that. But in the next round, if he does want to make any change to this, I would try to move this further out and just generally give you better access this direction, which is a more natural way for flicking rather than having to come up like that. Um, but as far as closing action goes, whew, man, I, this is just a heavy enough blade that it was always going to close well, but boy, does it close well. Like, it's one of those things where it doesn't fall freely on its own because of how much pressure is on here, but any kind of littlest bit of swing in the right direction and this thing wants to fall. It's just, it's very fun to fidget with in that regard. But the big reason why it's fun to fidget with is just because that powerful smack out. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, um, is there anything else I really wanted to talk about this before we jump to the inside? Nah, nah. Let's jump to the inside. So I just took this apart to clean it because it's feeling kind of gritty and I was also just dying to know how disassembly even worked with this thing and what was going on with the bearings and everything like that. And the moment I finished taking it apart, I realized I probably wasn't supposed to do that. Uh, this is a prototype and I didn't ask permission and I, yeah, I just, I, I shouldn't have done this, I'm sorry. So Kane, if you're watching this right now and you're furious that I just took this apart, I, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I should have asked. Hopefully you can go back to my channel, see that I've done uh, disassemblies a whole bunch of times, generally speaking, know what I'm doing and I take good care of things. Um, so hopefully that makes you feel more comfortable with it. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, again, I'm sorry, I should have asked. Um, but now that I have this apart, I guess uh, this is a really cool opportunity to show people because this, this is, this is interesting what's going on in here. Now I mentioned on the outside shot that these um, flathead cross screw looking things are going away and I'm pretty sure these are just for show. I, I guess I can't truly know for sure, but I looked at this under my microscope even, and I'm pretty confident these are all one solid piece and that these slots are milled into this, that this, this back part cannot come off, that this is all one solid piece. And the fact that these are then D-shaped and captive and D-shaped and captive into right there and right there means that this can't even turn. And so I'm really glad that these slots are coming off because it would be so tempting to take a screwdriver like this and stick it in here and think that you're gonna try and turn it and accidentally slide out and scrape something when in reality this 
just physically cannot turn. So again, glad that those are going away. But yeah, these these are captive. And so there at the back, there is this um, big old uh, screw-like thing that goes in here. And then there's this uh, spacer that goes around it. And so this is what you're seeing on the outside. And it gives it that nice shiny look and hides the fact that there is this D-shape right there. If you didn't have this, you would be able to see that little hollow bit. And then on the front end, this is this is the thing that's whole fascinating about this is like this is the screw like the screw itself is huge and has a hole. And it's the same thing up here on the pivot. We've got this big old super thick pivot and then the screw that goes all the way in. So on both of these, the part that actually comes out is the part that takes a four millimeter or what is that? Five thirty second. Do I have that anywhere? It's it's a four millimeter uh, hex wrench, but I'm pretty sure that four millimeter, yeah, four millimeter is interchangeable with five thirty second for all intents and purposes. Now, if you if you're thinking like I I don't have one of these, like how why you know why is he using something non standard? Um, this is the size of like hex wrench or Allen key that you'll get with the vast majority of flat pack furniture. And so if you've ever like assembled an IKEA furniture thing and you have the little L shaped hex wrench it's that that's the size that's the size you need um so you you almost assuredly do have it and it is it's just it's just genuinely really quite neat um seeing how this works yeah that this is like using this type of thing is a really nice deep fit and how there's just this hole through it but the consequence the other thing i really wanted to know is that being able to have this hole going through means that the the pivot itself has to be huge this is huge so i measured this and this is, I would say, I, I'm pretty sure this is an eight millimeter pivot. It's not exactly eight millimeters. Um, it's, well, here, let's just show you. This is, um, yeah, it's not exactly eight millimeters. It's 7.96, but, uh, you know, that's, I, I don't, I've never heard of anyone having a pivot this size. And it also doesn't line up with like any other, it's like, it's not exactly 5 sixteenths. It's, it's kind of 5 16 I don't know. Given that this is a, uh, you know, a Chinese OEM build, I'm pretty sure it's, it's, it's an eight millimeter pivot. And then these bearings are enormous. The inner diameter here is uh, like 8.38 is what I usually got when I measured this and got this to line up correctly. Well, you can see there's a little bit of variance in how I can measure, but yeah, I measured this at about 8.3 millimeters. Um, the re and oh, by the way, and these are two millimeter balls. And so these are just really big. So at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to replace these with something like skiffs. I don't know any third party aftermarket that makes something in this eight by two millimeter size. It's just, it's just really uncommon, but I want to assure you, I don't think you need to. These are really nicely done. These are already, uh, ceramic balls themselves and they flow really really nicely and i know that some people really want to swap uh, uh, these type of stamped bearings uh, with skiffs so that they don't have this cave you know concave part in here to trap gunk but you can see that the bearings themselves rest inside this pocket that is actually a reasonably good tight fit and so it's it's very unlikely for debris to get up inside around that small little gap and get inside so again you're not going to be able to swap these with skiffs, but I don't, I just don't think you really need to. Um, otherwise, there's nothing really wild going on in here. You can see that the screws holding this, uh, so actually that right there. So this is a, a titanium suit. I don't know. I don't even call this pseudo frame. It acts like a bolster lock in a sense, but this lock bar is thick enough that they're able to actually have a piece of uh, steel insert into here. You know, a lot of lock bars just aren't this thick, so they can't put a steel lock bar insert. And the screws for this, instead of being on the inside where they might run up against the um, the blade itself, because you can't recess them into this. this. Everything is just way too thin to recess it. They have to put the screws on the outside. And you can see right there that they stick up ever so slightly. And as a result, there's these little pockets right there. Can I get... Yeah, there you can kind of see the light. I don't know if it's focusing, but... Yeah, so these little pockets right there to house those screw heads when you push this all the way in. Otherwise, there's not anything weird going on in here. Uh, there are uh, steel raceway washers uh, for the, the ceramic balls to ride on. And yeah, this is just 
This is just weird, mostly because of the this stuff that's going on. This is what's weird. Everything else is not all that weird. But yeah, really cool to see inside. And again, Kane, uh, sorry, I took it apart. So my final thoughts on this knife is that I think it's really interesting. I think the handle looks really cool. It's doing some things in a truly novel way. I think this pass through is genuinely just cool looking. I find it just cool. It's interesting to me. And I find that um, having the the like hex screw is kind of obnoxious to take it apart, but it's not that bad. And these are actually really, really easy to come by. You, probably you have even a bit like this if you have a bit set. Um, and so I don't mind any of that. I think this knife fits my hand great. And so if you are into this type of blade shape, and if you're into a three and a half inch type knife, this is, and you want like a, a slightly heavier, I forgot to mention that this is 4.8 ounces, 4.775. Um, and if if you're into like a bigger kind of heavier sturdier knife i think i think you should go for it this is this is pretty freaking cool now let's move on to these fellas so now when i first uh, signed up for the pass around, I didn't realize these were coming too. And I probably wouldn't have signed up for them because this just isn't a me style knife i uh it's a very stylized knife and i know a lot of people love 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 the look of this knife but this is i'm just not into clip points and this is a hyper stylized clip point knife and so this is just never going to be a me knife but what i will say is for this aesthetic i think this is very very well done like it's got really nice curves and lines to it it again has really well thought out well placed chamfers that are not just boring it's not just a simple line around the outside it's um got yeah again like i think there's really good flow this this guy kane isn't making knives that are really targeted to me but it's clear to me that he's got a very developed clear design aesthetic and that he's really good at this kind of design again this is a knife that feels fantastic in my hand the ergos here are all great everything just kind of lines up all the flows are nice and best tech nailed the production on these there's no sharpness anywhere there's so many nice little chamfers i forgot to mention that over here but these are um contoured handles on both of these designs um i for also forgot to mention the, the width on this the thickness on this i don't know if it's going to change that's why i didn't really mention it because the blade stock is going to change so that probably is going to make this change but right now this is uh point uh five to five inches which at this size fills your hand quite nicely but the big thing is just that these contourings this all feels so nice i also don't know if this is going to change so this right now is a 3.5 millimeter blade stock and on his website though he lists it as 3.7 millimeter and so since over here he said that this this was also three just over 3.5 and he says it's going up to 3.9 i think he's saying that he's going to increase the blade stock on these as well but i also heard if you watch stasa's video on this that he said from talking to the guy that these are going to be thinned out and lightened in some way and so those two things seem at odds with each other i don't really know i haven't talked with kane so i don't know what to believe and that's part of the reason why I'm just not going to spend a huge amount of time on the details of this knife, because I think they're all going to change. But there are some important things to worth, uh, that are worth noting if you're going to compare the two. There, there's, um, they look at first glance like, like the same knife, but it's just in different colorways. But there's actually some fairly big differences about how, how they behave and certainly in how they feel. But just again, let's just look at that look. Man, Again, it's not for me, but boy, does it look well thought out. It's such a cohesive, smooth, honestly beautiful design. And the big thing is that these look like custom knives, don't they? These just look like true, real custom knives. This, this is, these, these just, you don't find designs like this from anyone but custom knife makers. And I guess he is, so I guess it all makes sense. Um, but yeah, going back to action and all that kind of fun, one of the things that really stood out to me and surprised me, because this, uh, because the Russ, these are called the Assetto, I forgot to mention that, because this, this one's called the Russ, because it has such a, like, practically non-functional, barely functional front flipper, I was surprised to see just how good the front flipper design is over here. Now, obviously these don't have thumb studs, so maybe he just put more attention to it because this is the primary method of opening, but these are very well designed front flippers. The fact that they, um, this whole thing curves down like this and this comes back like this means that it doesn't stick out terribly far. And you're definitely going to be noticing this big swedge part right here. And that's the thing that's gonna be drawing your eye when you look at it close, you're not really gonna notice that. And so it's, I'd say it's a pretty unobtrusive front flipper, but it sticks up enough and has just enough right angle that it works works so freaking well i yeah it it's 
it's fantastic. The other thing that he did really nicely is he kept going the jumping up and around. And so you can come at it from the front, you can come at it from the top, you can kind of reach down at the top like this and push down. And all of these work really, really well. And on this one in particular, boy, does that work easy. So, so easy. Now we come over to here and it's a different story. So I said earlier that by making this a, a, a bolster lock, even though like if the, the bulk of this looks like it's going to be the same, you have a really dramatic impact on lock bar strength. And so if we look at how thin the lock bar relief is here, it's about that thick. And we look at about the exact same spot right there, it's about the same. Those have about the same thickness. But the rest of this lock bar then thickens all the way back up, which means from here to here, yes, it can bend right there the same that this one can bend right here, but the entire rest of this bar is so much stiffer. And this one's so much more flexible from being thin this whole way. And so the result is that this is a nice and flexible lock bar, which gives us, I'd say, light detent, which is exactly what you want on a top flipper or front flipper like this. This one has uh, just much, much firmer, stiffer, less flexible lock bar. And the end result is that this one, you have to push reasonably hard. Now on the one hand, that gives you a very nice pop. But on the other hand, it starts to wear my thumb some. And, my, and the bigger thing is that, oof, okay, I'm going to brace this with the back of my hand because if you can get a firm enough grip, that you can brace this, then sure works great because the design is exactly the same. It gives you plenty amount of kind of leverage to be able to pull back, but you don't have to quite pull up. And so works great. The problem is, is that there's so much force when this pops out and I have such a hard time holding this in my hand in a stable way without putting my finger on this lock bar because it takes up a th at least a third of this whole distance that I've had this fly out of my hand when opening it three times already. Luckily, all from just like an inch above this table and onto this table. And that's partly lucky because look how freaking pointy this tip is. Oh my God, that is such a piercy jabby tip. If I had done this standing up above my foot, that would stab the heck out of my foot. That would just murder my foot. So my foot would be gone. So <laughs> I don't know. I think that um, if you don't plan on doing the reach around, then great. Because look like look where my hand wants to hit. My wants to put pressure right on. Anyway, if you don't plan on doing the reach around, great. This the action on this one is fantastic. It's so nice and snappy. But if you do want that flexibility to be able to do the reach around really, really easily, not only does the lighter lock bar pressure work, but the bolster lock itself means that you can really easily brace this however you want, and you're not gonna be putting any pressure on the lock bar. So it's just a lot easier. The other thing is that closing on this, these are both um, they just a lot lighter blades. If he does thicken this up, because this is, like I said, this is 3.5 millimeters right now, but he says it's going to be 3.7. If he does thicken this up, that might make the blade a little bit heavier, which might make this kind of closing action a little bit more. But right now they are, they are shake or kind of swing home knives. They're not hard. And if I'm not under camera and I kind of do an actual swinging motion, they do swing closed, but they're definitely not free fall knives. They do have a really nice hollow grind, but that's part of the reason why this blade is so light. You can fall your nail in a way that um, puts the tip right on your nail. And I don't love that. I would like to see this entire uh, finger choil, I mean, sorry, sharpening choil extended outward so that you can land right behind this. But this is a light enough blade that even if it comes down, it's just not coming with that much force. It's a, it's a very light blade. Oh, speaking of sharpening joils, this is a cross between really, really well done and kind of not well done at the same time. This is a very steep drop off and I adore that. And it comes up so high that you do have this entire distance for sharpening. The problem is that it's like right here. And so to get all the way up to this edge, you are having to come right up to that plunge. And so while you do have this distance, you're gonna have to be careful back here not to knock that back part. Um, I forgot to show that over here. But you can see that the plunge is done totally differently over here. This is the kind of plunge that has a long gradual droop and you can see that it doesn't end really until right about the end. And so there actually is a tiny little bit of a smile coming up already. And so on this, I would like to see this to be a more aggressive plunge to make it so that you have uh, more distance away from that plunge when you're sharpening. Here, it's a fantastically aggressive plunge. It's basically a complete drop off, just a 
complete drop off, but they ended this a little bit soon. So my one big suggestion for him, hopefully he might have already done this because of feedback from others from months ago, but my big suggestion would be just to extend this arc forward. And that would also, like I said, allow it to drop to your nail in a way that's slightly less grabby, but this is such a thin blade. Now, um, the other really big thing um, I would change about this is I think these clips are just too long. If you look at uh, where this hits in my hand, it kind of always hits right up into this pad. And so if it falls back here, then you don't feel it. So if I really can't this backward, then it hits in a place that I don't feel this clip. But if I if I hold this in the kind of grip that's more natural for me, it's hitting right up into this pad. And it's, it's pokey enough that like in short, I, if I just hold it like this, I don't notice anything. But it's the moment that I start putting force on this and kind of rubbing my hand and, and, and doing the motions you actually get when you, when you cut through stuff, that I start feeling it kind of jab me. The big thing is that it's just just slightly longer than you would find on a, a knife of this size typically. Like it's it's basically the exact same size clip as you have over here on the Russ, but the Russ is just a dramatically bigger knife. And so it should everything should have been scaled down slightly. So yeah, but as from a, a functionality perspective, works great, nice spring to it, holds in well. I like all that. The last thing I really wanted to talk about on this is that um this thing is this thing is really really light. It feels really really light. If we look at this guy over here, it's not that much heavier. Um, it's sorry, it's 0. 0.6 inches heavier. So this is so inches 0.3 out. Wow, this is a 3.027 ounce blade, and this is a 3.6 five, six ounce knife. And so there's really only 0.63 ounces behind them, between them. There's not, that, that, that doesn't sound like it's gonna be that much, but since everything else dimension wise is exactly the same and because of where that weight is, the weight is all back here, this feels like a much heavier knife and the balance point on it is back here right behind that little point right there. And so that balance is definitely further back than I want. I would want it to be right here. I would accept it to be right there. Instead, it's all the way down here, basically right under this one. And that's, it's, it's fine, but I definitely feel the weight back here. You bring that over here and this knife feels so light in comparison. And the balance on this is now right up here directly in front of that. And I know that doesn't seem like all that much difference and it's still not really where I'd want it to be, but it's enough to make it feel dramatically different. This feels so much better because the weight is, that all of the weight reduction was removed from the back part that was the heavy part. And yeah, this just feels a lot more balanced and nimble. Partly the way they're doing that. That's the last thing I really want to emphasize is the thing that they're doing really interestingly on this knife that I, the, I honestly don't know if I've ever seen before is look at this. Yeah, okay. So normally frame lock, uh, bolster lock knives don't have any kind of skeletonization because they're thinning out the titanium so much that they just leave it like that. But this has been skeletonized this entire way. On both sides, there's these pockets. And that you can see, yeah, that's the micarta right there. And so this is like really skeletonized out the back. And that is so cool. Well, that's a very a smart way of getting the balance of this knife and the weight on this knife down to something that's really, really nice. Now, the, neither are heavy, heavy knives. This is, you know, a 3.24 inch blade and this one's 3.6. So that's a bit above, but not terribly above the ounce and inch mark. And this one's actually below the ounce and inch mark. But again, this one feels perfect. And this one in comparison, especially if you have this one, if you only had this one, maybe you wouldn't notice, this one in comparison feels heavier. So my final thoughts on these is these are just kind of uncontroversially good. I wasn't going to sign up for them originally because they looked well done and it's just a blade shape that wasn't super me. I'm glad I checked them out because it is. They are. They're really good. They're really well done. The handles feel great and this experiencing the flow and shape and design of these handles in person and over here too has convinced me that this guy, Kane Grambo, is good at this. Like he has, he has an eye for this. He has a talent for creating well thought out, beautiful knives. 
Um, none of these are enough of me knives for me to get in on any of them. But if you like them, if you like the look of them, these are well done. Um, at least on the prototypes here, Best Tech knocked it out of the park on finishing. I This is really good finishing from Best Tech, but on, on, on their OEM work, Best Tech does great work. And so, yeah, again, if you like the looks of these, I think they're worth it. I'm really glad I got to check them out because they've either convinced me that this guy is good at what he does and I should keep paying attention, or in addition to that, they just showed me some weird stuff that no one else is trying to do. So anyway, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you guys for watching and thank you. Uh, I'll catch you guys next time. Thank you.